Welcome to another episode of the Human Potential Lab, where I teach you the latest science of important psychological concepts that are relevant to your daily life. Today, I'm going to be teaching you about the intersection of personality, creativity, and well-being. These are all three things that are very interesting to people. And when you look at the integration of them, you can really get close to a life well-lived. So first off, I want to just do a little primer on what is personality? A lot of people think of personality as this thing that is ingrained, that uh, doesn't change much throughout our lives, that you are either an extrovert or you're an introvert. You are either highly neurotic or you're highly not neurotic. And that's just not the right way to think about personality in general. It turns out that personality is actually something that is quite fluid and can be context dependent. Uh, It's partly determined by our genes and it's also partly determined by the environment. But when we talk about personality, we're just talking about what, what psychologists call density distributions. So throughout the course of your day, you tend to score more introverted, let's say, in most of your actions, like a four or five on a five point scale. But um, you may have your moments where you're extremely extroverted. Maybe you get really inspired um, to stand on a table and dance. (laughs) Who knows, you know, what the context can bring out of a human. (laughs) Um, So I think it's important, first of all, to just say that personality is not something set in stone and can change. With that said, there is some stability, some very meaningful stability to our average patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Because that's what personality is at the end of the day. It is our total pattern of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Now, we can, through a lot of intense effort, try to change our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. um, And in doing so, change important parts of our personality. But we can also accept a lot of our patterns of thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and embrace our personality. So it's only up to you to decide what you want to embrace and self-accept and what you want to change. And the good news is that you can change your personality. So that out of the way, I want to talk about how modern day psychologists conceptualize personality because they view it as a hierarchy. And so I want you to take a good look at this graph here and note that we have various levels at which we can talk about human personality. And at the very top level, there's actually a big two. We call it the big two of personality. So at the, at the highest level of description in the personality hierarchy, we can note that humans differ in the extent to which they feel stable um, in their lives. They feel emotionally stable. They feel like they can reach their goals um, and, 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 and move toward their goals, even with internal disruptions, such as uh, emotional upset, um, as well as external disruptions, um, like a traumatic episode that happens. So... People do differ in their personality in terms of how high they score in stability. But we also need to acknowledge there's a second part of personality called plasticity, which is the extent to which you're flexible and capable of adapting and changing. Both stability and plasticity are absolutely essential to the uh, healthy functioning of the whole person, or more technically, to the efficient functioning of any cybernetic organism, which includes humans. All cybernetic organisms are goal-directed organisms. That's all it means to be cybernetic. Some people might think cybernetics and think like Terminator or something like robots. Um, Actually, the the science of cybernetics is actually the study of organic goal-directed systems, and that includes humans. Um, It also includes um, other systems, other biological systems um, that are goal-oriented like us. But any goal-directed organism must have a certain degree of stability uh, as well as plasticity to fully thrive. Okay, with that out of the way, let's go one step lower in the personality hierarchy to the big five. Um, which is probably what most of you have heard of when you've heard of personality. You heard of, you, if you took like an intro to psychology class, you've heard of the big five personality traits. And that's really what I'm going to focus on a lot today, um, as well as the, asp- the main aspects of each of the big five. So when I say that there are, main, there are the main aspects of each of the big five, if you look at this graph, you can see that um, the big five includes neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and openness to experience or openness slash intellect. But underneath each of those are two main aspects 
that really make up that big five. You could go even lower to the facet level and have all sorts of facets. There could be an unlimited number of facets um, associated with each aspect of the big five. But just for our understanding in this lecture today, we're going to focus on the aspects of each of the big five because I think it'll really allow you to wrap your head around what really that personality trait is and what its major, most uh, functional uh, com components are that are relevant for your daily life. Let's start with extroversion, introversion. So that's the dimension, the extroversion slash introversion dimension of personality. Modern day personality psychologists view it as a single continuum. So to the extent to which you score higher on the extroversion poles, the extent to which you're less of an introvert. And then the more you score high to the left of the in, uh, on the pole to the introversion side, the less you are an extrovert. And that's how modern day personality psychologists tend to think of it. The two main aspects of extroversion are enthusiasm and assertiveness. Let's look at some of the items and see how they're tested to see maybe where you score on these two. So for the enthusiasm aspect, you have things like laugh a lot, show my feelings when I'm happy, often get caught up in the excitement. And then for the assertiveness aspect, you have things like take charge, am the first to act, don't hold back my opinions. So if you score really high in enthusiasm and assertiveness, you are essentially high in extroversion. It's, it's a continuum. There is no pure extrovert or pure introvert. And in fact, most people score somewhere there in the middle where they're kind of ambiverts. You know, they, they're not an extreme introvert or extrovert. And I think we all know who are the ones who are the extremes. They're kind of obvious, even through like five seconds of talking to them. You can tell if someone's a really enthusiastic leader, assertive person, you know, who's, who's has to jump right in and take charge and take over. They're an extrovert. And we can also tell if they're an introvert. So they're opposite in that where they prefer, maybe they have a preference for solitude. Maybe they have a preference for more quiet. Uh, maybe they are not as expressive on their face when you're talking to them. You know, there's some people who are like golden retrievers, right? Like, <laughs> and there are some who just like to take a step back and process things a little bit more deeply. And maybe you don't know what, um, if they're, you don't know how they are reacting to what you're saying, but maybe they'll come back later with an incredibly thoughtful, compassionate response to what you've told them. I find the latest neuroscience of the extroversion, introversion dimension really interesting uh, because you see a lot of memes online that like introverts, um, they get their batteries drained faster, um, their social batteries, they need to recharge. You know, you see that meme over and over again, whereas extroverts don't need to recharge their social batteries much. We can actually put that within a modern day framework of dopamine. And I find the link between dopamine and, and, introver and the introversion, extroversion dimension really interesting because through dopaminergic terms, it does actually take introverts more work to get energized over um, what we call primal rewards, um, things like social status, power, um, social attention, positive social attention, networking events, um, risky sex, those sorts of things. We call them primal rewards. Um, introverts, with the way their dopaminergic system functions, they tend to um, have to work a little bit harder to get energized for those things. Whereas extroverts tend to have this more naturally uh, dopaminergic functioning to those more primal reward centers of their brain. So it naturally energizes them more and can show as enthusiasm for those things. However, there are a lot of misconceptions about introverts and there are also a lot of misconceptions about extroverts. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. I wrote this article in Scientific American um, summarizing some research, some very interesting research showing that both introverts and extroverts get exhausted from too much socializing. So even extroverts are human too, believe it or not. Um, even the most extroverted of the extrovert, um, while their threshold for getting tired from socializing uh, may be higher uh, than the introvert, uh, they still too, at a certain point, uh, can get exhausted from too much socializing. So we're just talking about thresholds here. And dopamine plays an important role in that uh, sense of whether or not you're feeling energized and wanting to put in the work towards something. That's really a big role of, of dopamine and it's in the role it plays in, in the human motivational system. The next personality trait I want to talk about is the agreeableness slash disagreeableness spectrum. So what, what, what are you thinking right now? How agreeable are you? How disagreeable are you? Let's look at some items. The two main aspects of agreeableness are politeness and compassion. 
So the kind of items for politeness are respect authority, hate to seem pushy, avoid imposing my will on others. And for compassion is things like feel others' emotions, inquire about others' well-being, take an interest in other people's lives. Now, this is where it's interesting to note that each of the aspects of, of each of the big five can actually pull apart in various ways. So you can score really high in politeness, but not compassion, or really high in compassion and not politeness. And some of these aspects can have unique correlations on things in the world. We will revisit this later um, when we show that maybe politeness is not as beneficial as compassion. Interestingly, from a neuroscience perspective, um, those who score very high in politeness tend to show errors of their brain having to do with uh, inhibitory control and, um, and the resistance of aggression, um, which suggests that people who score high in politeness not, are not necessarily compassionate people. Um, they're actually just really good at inhibiting their angry impulses. So that's interesting to note. Compassion seems to be associated with a separate neuroscientific foundation. Within the agreeable-disagreeableness domain, um, I'm really interested in the dark triad um, and its counterpart, which my researchers uh, and I uh, came up with. So the dark triad is a very well-studied set of antagonistic or disagreeable personality dimensions. We have narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. So narcissism is a very, is a very entitled self-importance. Uh, psychopathy has to do with um, with meanness, lying, um, deceit, um, and Machiavellianism has to do with a very strategic long-term manipulation of what you want to get out of others, um, being fine exploiting others for your own gain. These three are correlated with each other. They also can come apart in interesting ways, but for the most part, they are correlated with each other, forming the dark triad. Now, my colleagues and I were interested um, in why there was so much research on the dark triad, but nothing on the light triad. So we created a light triad scale, which is not the exact opposite of the dark triad. You can actually score high in the dark triad and also score somewhat uh, on the light triad as well, or all sorts of different combinations, high on the light triad and have a little dark triad. Um, but um, we do see it as a nice counterpart to the dark triad. So the three main aspects of the light triad are Kantianism, faith in humanity, and humanism. Um, so Kantianism is treating people as ends unto themselves, not mere means. Faith in humanity is believing in the fundamental goodness of humans. And humanism is valuing the dignity and worth of each individual. This is an image that someone on the internet came up with. Um, it looks like, um, what's their name? Rayleigh Lewis. Uh, Anyway, big shout out to Rayleigh, Rayleigh Lewis for, for coming up with this. We think it's really neat. It shows the different items associated with each of the three members of the light triad. Um, so let me just give you some examples from each of these. So an example of humanism would be like, I tend to admire others. I tend to applaud the successes of other people. For Kantianism, we have prefer honesty over charm. Um, I like to be authentic, even if it may damage my reputation. And for faith in humanity, I tend to see the best in people uh, and I'm quick to forgive people who have hurt me. In fact, forgiveness is a big one, uh, a big marker. Uh, the, la the, the inability to forgive is a big marker of the dark triad, which is very interesting. So uh, we, we see great benefit to studying the light triad in addition to the dark triad. And we have to understand that we're all a mix of all these things. And we also, context can bring out the worst in us. I, as I mentioned earlier, context matters too for personality. It's not all uh, our innate dispositions. Um, and uh, the context can absolutely bring out the worst in us. And it can also bring out the best in us. Here's an interesting question. Are most humans good? Well, Anne Frank seemed to think so. Anne Frank was writing in her diary all the way up to the moment where the Nazis were coming up to find her, to kill her. She wrote, I still believe at the end of the day that most people are good at heart. That's a rough paraphrase of what she said. But she clearly would score high in the light triad and her faith in humanity. And what you do find is that even though all of us are some mix of light and dark traits, uh, most people are tipped to the light side. Um, that's good news. Um, but the, there's bad news too in the sense that if you see in this graph um, a couple of those little dots, a lot of those uh, little circles, uh, which are people, all the way to the far right down dark triad, extremely high, almost pure dark triad, there are examples of extreme malevolence. 
Um, and unfortunately, all it takes is a couple people to ruin it for the rest of us. So personality matters. And the way we show up in the world and our being in the world really matters. The next trait I want to talk about is neuroticism. Uh, I like this meme that I saw on the internet, the top seven traits of neuroticism, because I think it it does nicely encapsulate some of the main facets of neuroticism. Things like negative emotions, extreme worry or anxiety, self-consciousness, anger and irritability, jealousy and feelings of envy, substance abuse, and self-doubt and low self-esteem. But the two main aspects of neuroticism are volatility and withdrawal. So some items that are good examples of volatility include things like I get angry easily. I change my mood a lot. I get easily agitated. So you think about the Incredible Hulk. Um, and then you think of the other one, withdrawal. I'm filled with doubts about things. Worry, I worry about things. I become overwhelmed by events. Um, actually, the Incredible Hulk, if I had to identify the Incredible Hulk's personality structure, would be high volatility plus high antagonism or aggression. So both of those in combination. We're all a mix of personality traits, and I think that's really important to remember, and there's lots of unique configurations. And we're going to get to uh, one of my favorite unique configurations at the end of this lecture, so stay tuned. The next personality trait I want to cover is conscientiousness, um, which is the trait most uh, central to the best-selling book Grit by my friend and colleague Angela Duckworth. Um, There's actually two main aspects of conscientiousness, though. One is industriousness, which really is uh, very strongly tied to the concept of grit. Things like I carry out my plans, I finish what I start, I'm not easily distracted. And another aspect is orderliness. Things like I like order, I keep things tidy, I see that rules are observed. So both of those are are, uh, the main aspects of conscientiousness. But as I've already noted, these different aspects can come apart in very important ways. Um, it's possible to have an awful lot of grit but not be terribly orderly. It's also possible to be a very orderly person um, but not really get a lot of your most important goals completed ever. And we're going to revisit uh, the distinction between industriousness and orderliness later when we talk about well-being. Okay, and now for the final personality trait that we're just going to cover at a very high level, openness to experience, or as my colleagues and I like to call it, cognitive exploration. I think I make it pretty clear uh, to anyone who knows me that that uh, openness to experience is my favorite personality trait. This is the one where I come most alive. <laughs> so the two main aspects of cognitive exploration are intellect and openness. Uh, These are important distinctions. So the kind of items for intellect are things like, I am quick to understand things. I like to solve complex problems. I engage with difficult reading material. And things like openness are things like, I believe in the importance of art. I love to reflect on things. I need a creative outlet. Now, they are correlated with each other. But as my PhD dissertation showed, um, they can really come apart in important ways when we're trying to predict creativity or we're trying to predict well-being. Um, They're not always correlated. And also, when we think about intelligence, um, I think it's important to think about intelligence as more than just intellect. I think that including some of the kind of things in the openness aspect are important when we conceptualize human intelligence. More on that in a second. But this is the paper that was the primary outgrowth of my PhD dissertation, where I tried to open up openness. Isn't that a cover title? (laughs) Um, A four-factor model in relations to creative achievement in the arts and sciences. Isn't that a nerdy subtitle? (laughs) Um, So in this work, I showed that the openness to experience aspect um, is really comprised by uh, two main facets under it, uh, uh, affective engagement and, and aesthetic or imagination engagement. So under the openness to experience part, Um, You can be really open to engaging in the full breadth and depth of your emotions. And you can also really be interested in creativity, aesthetics, and the imagination. And then on the intellect side, we can have just pure raw IQ or what I called explicit cognitive ability because I was trying to contrast it from more intuitive intelligence or or implicit learning, Um, as well as intellectual engagement. So I want to be very clear, it's important to distinguish the extent to which you enjoy intellectual pursuits and like engaging in intellectual pursuits and your raw 
IQ uh, or uh, ex- explicit cognitive ability. Your cognitive ability could be very high, but you might not be a very intellectually curious person. Also, maybe your your IQ is not sky high, but you still are incredibly intellectually curious. And I think we need to really leave room open for that um, uh, to appreciate in our society. Um, and I put a lot of these um, these, these this research and uh, passion that I have for uh, for intelligent human intelligence and the openness domain in my book, Ungifted Intelligence Redefined: The Truth About Talent, Practice, Creativity, and the Many Paths to Greatness. Um, in this book, I put forward a theory of self-actualizing intelligence, or at the time I called it the theory of personal intelligence, but now I call it the theory of self-actualizing intelligence. Um, where I defined as the dynamic interplay of engagement and ability in pursuit of personal goals. And so I think that personality matters a lot. Um, but, and I, and I think that intelligence matters a lot. But I think the key there is what is the dynamic interplay of our abilities and, um, personality inclinations and the engagement that we have and the, 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 the ways that our dispositions, our personality dispositions are causing us to want to engage in certain areas of life? And how is all of that in the service of us reaching our personal goals, our dreams in our life? Um, So I think this is a broader view of intelligence than just the traditional IQ model of intelligence. So let's now talk about the link between personality and creativity. I love this connection. By far, the most relevant personality domain for the understanding of creativity is openness to experience. Surprise, surprise, that this domain of personality would be most relevant for creativity. Um, one of my favorite studies ever was the E. Paul Torrance studies in the 50s, where E. Paul Torrance looked at a group of elementary school kids. Actually, there were three elementary schools. And he looked to see uh, what would happen if we followed these kids up throughout their lives. Who would end up being the most creative people? He found that a certain list of what he called the beyonder characteristics were really important. Things like love of work, um, persistence, feeling a sense of purpose in life. And yet even some elementary school students showed the seeds of this. Um, Being deep thinkers, not necessarily fast thinkers, but deep thinkers. Having tolerance of mistakes. uh, Being openness to change. Uh, sense having a sense of risk taking and feeling comfortable as a minority of one. I really like this one. I wonder where would you score on this? So if you're in a situation where no one agrees with you on anything, uh, everyone in the room has a dissenting view, but you would like to stick to your guns. Are you okay being a minority of one? He found that those who scored higher in these beyonder characteristics tended to grow up being more creative in their lives. But he found the biggest predictor of lifelong creativity was none none of the things on this list. It was the extent to which people fell in love with a future image of themselves. I love this quote from Tarns. Life's most energizing and exciting moments occur in those split seconds when our struggling and searching are suddenly transformed into the dazzling aura of the profoundly new, an image of the future. One of the most powerful wellsprings of creative energy, outstanding accomplishment, and self-fulfillment seems to be falling in love with something, your dream, your image of the future. Love that quote. <laughs> um, more modern day research by my colleagues and I um, have found that this imagination aspect that comes from openness to experience um, and the intellectual uh, curiosity part, they offer valuable information in predicting lifelong creativity above and beyond just raw IQ. This paper called Openness to Experience and Intellect, Differentially Predict Creative Achievement in the Arts and Sciences, um, found that when predicting lifelong creative achievement, intellectual engagement does a better job of predicting it than IQ, although IQ is also uh, an independent predictor. And then in the sciences, when we talk of things like music, visual arts, um, creative writing, we talk about the various aspects of uh, the arts, we found that IQ actually was not correlated with creative achievement in the arts, but what was correlated with creative achievement in the arts um, above all everything else was openness to experience, um, which really, as I've noted, involves a deep, um, uh, rich imagination as well as an openness to engaging in the full depth and breadth of your emotions. In this other paper, my colleagues and I looked at the extent to which grit um, is important for creative achievement. And remember earlier, I said that the various aspects of the personality domains can come apart in very important ways. Um, We found that the 
consistency part of grit was not as good a predictor of creativity as the ability to persevere, to really be committed to something in the long term and to um, show a deep uh, perseverance toward it. But being consistent in your goals is... N- is not necessarily is not necessarily the most predictive thing of creativity because creativity often involves a lot of trial and error. Creativity often involves having to shift goals, having to be flexible. Remember, I talked about the stability personality trait at the beginning. Um, if you score very low in the stability personality trait and you're just stable, <laughs> um, that's not the optimal functioning of any cybernetic system. So it's very important to recognize that. We found that curiosity was a much better predictor of creativity. In fact, curiosity and persistence as a combo were a much better predictor of lifelong creativity than just being consistent. Neurologically speaking, intellect and openness to experience are associated with different areas of the brain. So intellect or IQ and intellectual engagement tend to activate more of um, what's called the executive control network. Areas of our brain that are really important for concentration, for working memory, being able to hold multiple bits of information in our heads at one time and being able to um, really focus um, and synthesize the information in consciousness. Whereas openness, uh, the openness aspect of the uh, openness slash intellect personality domain tends to activate more of what I call the imagination brain network or other scientists call it the default mode brain network. But I did not feel as though that was as sexy as the imagination network. Um, And the imagination brain network uh, tends to involve a number of brain areas that work together to help us imagine our personal futures, to take the perspective of another person, to uh, remember our most poignant and emotional memories, Um, In a lot of ways, I see the imagination brain network as the source of human experience, whereas the executive control network is certainly very important for processing things coming outside of us. The imagination network is uh, very important um, for our inner stream of consciousness. My colleagues and I have been really interested in the relationship between various brain activations and personality. In this paper from 2015 uh, in the journal Human Brain Mapping, we found for the first time that individual differences in intellect openness to experience are associated with the efficiency of the imagination brain network. Um, and we think this is super interesting. So the extent to which various areas of the default mode network are connected and communicating with each other Uh, are associated with the extent to which you self-report on a personality scale where you score on the intellect openness to experience dimension of personality. So these personality traits really can be linked to various um, consistent activations of the brain, Um, further showing that personality is not purely uh, contextual. Um, There is there is a very important core part of the way our brains function, um, that is correlated with our patterns of thinking, behaving, and feeling in the world. In this other paper, we linked creativity um, to brain functioning and found that in the earliest stages of creativity, um, or what researchers call divergent thinking, your ability to come up with as many different uses for something, we found that deactivation of the executive control network is actually quite conducive to divergent thinking or creative creative thinking. Um, Whereas kind of swimming in the sea of the default mode network or the imagination network can be more beneficial. Um, And that makes a lot of sense. You know, when you're doing a creative task, you want your self-critical thinking consciousness to not get in the way of brainstorming or coming up with lots of ideas. Whereas during the later stages, when you want to evaluate your ideas or evaluate the quality of your ideas a little bit more, then the executive control network uh, comes online more. So uh, this shows this graph here just shows the time course of divergent thinking ability and which brain networks come online and offline during that time course. And more recently, um, the work I've done at the Imagination Institute at Penn, um, where we looked at uh, some of the most imaginative people uh, from all over the world, uh, from all different uh, domains, 
um, from at least 10 domains we, we looked at, um, we found that the most imaginative people really have this higher level of resting state connectivity um, in, in that default mode network or that imagination network. So you really can see that difference when you look at the brains of eminent thinkers and non-eminent thinkers. So we found that at various levels. Um, I won't get too much in the technical details, but there's various levels at which you can look at a neuroscientific finding. Um, one involves just a resting state where they just at rest, where's their brain tend to go by default. Um, you can also look in terms of brain activity patterns. And we found very similar um, uh, thing there. We found a very similar thing there with activation of the imagination brain network differences um, when doing a creative idea generation task. Um, and then you can also look at brain morphometry where you can actually look at structural differences um, between eminent thinkers and non-eminent thinkers. And there are some significant um, structural differences um, associated with extraordinary creativity. You know, they, they saved Einstein's brain, right? Because they tried to look to see, is, is there something different with Einstein's brain than other people's brains? But that really was not a good scientific analysis. The brain deteriorated in lots of ways. I think so they cut it up in various ways. They never were really able to do a really good analysis of that. But my colleagues and I have been trying to look at that among some of the most creative people alive today. Um, and we do see that some areas of the default mode network are a little thicker. Um, and there are other other nuances that if you really are dying to uh, nerd out about this, uh, you can download any of these papers from my website, scottbarrykaufman.com, under the research section. And you can dive in, get your popcorn out, and study all you want about the morphometry of creative eminent thinkers. I also want to discuss um, a personality trait and kind of place it within the big five because you hear about it a lot. And that's the highly sensitive person. What exactly is the highly sensitive personality? Uh, Lane Aaron has done a lot for the field in initiating our understanding, awareness, and appreciation of the highly sensitive personality. One of her books is called The Highly Sensitive Child, Helping Our Children Thrive When the World Overwhelms Them. Within a big five framework, the HSP personality really is just a blend of neuroticism and openness to experience. So if you look at the kind of items on the HSP scale, you can see that they're really just items referring to either neuroticism or openness to experience. Things like I am easily overwhelmed by strong sensory input. I seem to be aware of subtleties in my environment. Other people's moods affect me. I tend to be very sensitive to pain. Um, and a lot of those have to do with neuroticism. But then there are things like associated with openness to experience, like I have a rich, complex inner life. I am deeply moved by the arts or music. Um, so those things as well um, indi indicate that uh, the highly sensitive person really is this blend of neuroticism and openness to experience. A lot of people claim to be HSPs, including assholes. Uh, so <laughs> here's an interesting question. Is Kanye West an HSP? Well, in one of the interviews, Kanye West um, said, uh, I think that I um, I'm a, people, I think I'm misunderstood. I'm really a, just a sensitive introvert. And I want to make clear that you can score high in the highly sensitive personality and still be disagreeable. You know, in the agreeable, disagreeable dimension um, is really a separate dimension than the highly sensitive personality dimension. And I cover these nuances in this article I wrote for Scientific American in 2013 um, that went viral. I called it 23 Signs, You're Secretly a Narcissist Masquerading as a Sensitive Introvert. Um, and I wanted to talk about the latest science of vulnerable narcissism and um, the science of being a highly sensitive person and show that, look, there's actually different ways you can be sensitive in this world. When we talk about the highly sensitive personality, we're usually talking about Elaine Aaron's definition, which is a blend of neuroticism and openness to experience. But I'm going to go through each of the the personality traits and show you that actually each form of personality, each dimension of personality is associated with its own unique form of sensitivity. All personality traits have an inherent sensitivity to something. And I think it's a really important point to make here. So for instance, people high in extroversion are sensitive to appetitive rewards or these primal rewards I was talking about earlier, like social status or social attention or risky sex or you know uh, money, power. Um, it just so happens throughout the course of evolutionary history that the most primal rewards tend to be social in nature because that tends to get us these other things. But people high in extroversion tend to be very sensitive to the reward value of appetitive rewards. People high in agreeableness are sensitive to other people's needs, goals, concerns, and feelings. 
People high in conscientiousness are sensitive to abstract or distant goals. People high in neuroticism are sensitive to threat. People high in openness to experience are sensitive to the value of information for its own sake. People high in vulnerable narcissism are hypersensitive to criticism and evaluation. And people high in grandiose narcissism are hypersensitive to cues of praise and acclaim. So just saying, I misunderstood, I'm not really a jerk, I'm just highly sensitive. Well, actually, you can be a jerk and and be highly sensitive. (laughs) You know, there's not mutually exclusive categories and it depends what are you sensitive to? You know, what is the sensitivity? Are you, are you sensitive? Are you, are you highly sensitive to the pain and suffering of others? Or are you highly sensitive to criticism and to people not, not worshiping you all the time? These are different forms of sensitivity. And I often don't see these distinctions made in the psychological literature or in general pop discussions of sensitivity. In the gifted community, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, Dabrowski's overexcitabilities, um, such as having a psychomotor overexcitability, having a sensual overexcitability, being intellectually overexcitable, having an imaginational overexcitability, or being emotionally overexcitable. I really like this paper by Barbara Kerr and her colleagues, which show that we can map these overexcitabilities onto a modern-day personality framework. Um, I'm just going to show you right here how they can be mapped on. So openness to fantasy is a facet of the intellect slash openness to experience domain. And we can map that onto the imaginational overexcitability component of Dabrowski's framework. Things like having a rich fantasy life and proneness to vivid daydreaming. Openness to aesthetics can be mapped onto sensual overexcitability, enjoyment and absorption in beauty and the arts. Openness to feelings can be mapped onto emotional overexcitability. Openness to a full range of feelings, both variety and intensity. Openness to ideas can be mapped onto intellectual overexcitability, having a ravenous curiosity, passion for learning, and need to understand ideas and the reasoning behind arguments. Um, This is very much tied to the uh, nerdy dopamine pathway, as I call it. Uh, That's where you get this nerdy uh, dopamine uh, um, excitement, this, this dopamine coursing through your system at the possibility of learning something new and complex. And then openness to actions can be mapped onto psychomotor overexcitability, a love of novelty and getting out of one's comfort zone. And I think that we can link each of these to to giftedness and uh, creative giftedness. I think a lot of creative people throughout the course of human history have scored quite high in these overexcitabilities, or we can just say high in these facets of openness to experience. I'm not a big fan of the phrase overexcitability. It sounds like you're too much, like you're over. But I think that uh, there's know too much if you're going to fundamentally change the world and uh, uh, with your creativity. So now, lastly, for this lecture, I want to cover the link between personality and well-being. And I think it's very important when we do this to recognize that well-being is composed of various facets in and of itself. What do we mean when we say well-being? You know, um, so it's important to recognize there's this for for this here of this graph here we can talk about Carol Rift's model we can have uh, and Carol Rift distinguishes between personal growth, self esteem, autonomy, uh, environmental mastery, positive relationships, and filling a life purpose. I think it's a pretty decent model of the different facets of well being. My colleagues and I uh, and this study was led by uh, Jesse Sun. Um, looked at the unique associations between big five personality aspects and multiple dimensions of well-being. And what my colleagues and I found are a couple key findings which I think you'll find really interesting when you're, inter- when you're thinking about the link between well-being and personality. So we found that the biggest unique predictors of well-being overall are enthusiasm, low withdrawal, industriousness, compassion, and intellect. But we can even have a much more nuanced look and show that enthusiasm and low withdrawal were the strongest unique predictors of high life satisfaction and positive emotions. So we, so it depends on what form of well-being are we talking about. Assertiveness strongly predicted greater autonomy in life. That makes sense. Industriousness was uniquely associated with environmental mastery, purpose in life, meaning, and accomplishment. Whereas orderliness was not correlated with these dimensions and even predicted lower levels of personal growth. Remember earlier I said I was going to get back to the orderliness thing. Well, it turns out that orderliness is not necessarily that good (laughs) for well-being. It's okay to not feel the need to control everything and for everything, have everything 
be put in place. With that said, uh, I'm not talking about OCD because I recently had an episode with Michael Alsi showing there are some uh, great uh, creative things that be- can be correlated with OCD. I'm just talking about the personality aspect of orderliness. And then compassion was uniquely associated with greater levels of personal growth, meaning, and purpose in life. And earlier I said that, you know, these things can come apart. And I think that it's important to distinguish between compassion and politeness because we found that politeness was the only aspect of personality to have no significant independent association with any other well-being dimensions. So maybe politeness is overrated. (laughs) Now, you don't want to be completely impolite, but maybe a certain level and then compassion takes over is more important. And then finally, as a key finding, we found that both intellect and openness were independently associated with personal growth and autonomy. We feel like these findings qualify earlier research because a lot of earlier earlier research on happiness really have made the case that only extroversion and neuroticism uh, are are relevant to happiness. We found there's a lot more nuance there when you expand your uh, aspects of personality that you study and you also expand the facets of well-being that you study. We say, quote, well-being is indeed higher for the extroverted and non-neurotic, but only to the extent that they possess the enthusiastic, non-withdrawn aspects of these traits. Further, when well-being is conceptualized in terms of multiple end states, there is more than one personality profile that predicts greater well-being. So now I want to return to the introvert. So what are we saying here? Are we saying that introverts can't be happy? No! Um, There's this uh, article I wrote with the title, Can Introverts Be Happy in a World That Can't Stop Talking? And I reviewed research suggesting that happy introverts can exist. I really like this paper, Quiet Flourishing. The authenticity and well-being of trait introverts living in the West depends on extroversion deficient beliefs. Basically, what the researchers found is the extent to which you were a happy introvert is the extent to which you self-reported as an introvert and you also were okay with it. You accepted yourself. As Rodney B. Lawn and his colleagues note, quote, introverts who can learn to be more comfortable with their place on the introversion extroversion continuum, for example, better thrive in our schools, universities, and workplaces, despite the fact that in the West, these institutions are often geared toward extroverted behavior. We speculate that introverts might learn to become more comfortable with their own introversion in these environments by focusing on eudaimonic concepts such as maintaining a positive attitude towards oneself and cultivating good character and practicing more self-acceptance and developing their signature strengths. Look, the more you judge yourself, the worse you're going to feel. Um, this doesn't just operate within the introversion domain. It operates with basically any any of the personality domains. And it also operates within the depression and anxiety dis- domain. This, this study here, this paper here, the title perfectly explains it. The more you judge, the worse you feel. A judgmental attitude toward one's inner experience predicts depression and anxiety. So I want to just end this lecture and say, well, look, there's so many different ways that personality can combine. Um, to create the unique configuration that is you. It's possible to be a neurotic extrovert. And it's also possible to score high in introversion as well as openness to experience. A unique configuration I call the wild introvert. Are you a wild introvert? Are you an introvert where you don't get so dopaminergically energized by networking events, um, social attention, social status, power, money, risky sex? But your nerdy dopamine pathway is highly active, so you get very turned on by learning new information and uh, and going on adventures in your head. Maybe you're a wild introvert. Whatever you are, I highly suggest that you consider, do you want to accept it? Do you want to change? And there are some aspects that maybe it's time to just accept who you are and embrace it and channel it into your creativity. I guarantee you that if you accept certain aspects of your personality, and channel it into your creativity, you'll be much more likely to be happy, to be fulfilled, and to live, and live a life of full meaning. I want to thank you all for listening to this lecture today. I hope it was educational, but I also hope it inspires you to embrace who you are, change what you want to change, and live a life full of creativity and well-being.
Thank you and stay tuned for the next episode of the Human Potential Lab.